So moving on to our first session, uh, which is titled Rafael Modi's, uh, Mo Modi's Nemesis. Uh, first, of course, both the speakers are already here. So uh, although they don't need any introductions, let me just, uh, as a matter of fact, introduce them. Uh, Enram is the chairman of the Hindu Publishing Group. He's one of the foremost journalists in India who's covered a lot of issues on foreign policy, national security, and communalism. He is formerly the editor-in-chief of the Hindu, the Frontline, the Business Line, and Sports Star. And uh, more recently, of course, he has been part of the five uh, series articles on the uh, various circumnavigations which have been done on the operationalization of the procurement of the Rafael jets. And uh, one of the reasons why we are all here at 10 a.m. Uh, the chair of the session is uh, P. Saina a journalist who has extensively written on rural affairs and Indian agriculture and is a recipient of various awards. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we consider him one of our own. Uh, the very idea of Mumbai Collective is something which was brought about in consultation and various discussions with him and others like him. I, I have to say a couple of words in defense of my old police commissioner, Satyapal Singh. <laughs> you know, well, he, he says two things that you cannot take exception to, okay? One, he is essentially asserting that Darwin is not beyond question, and in science I agree with that. Nobody is beyond question. The second thing he says, which you cannot take exception to is, no one of us has ever gone into the forest and seen apes turn into men. Now, that is also unexceptionable and absolutely true. And we must recognize, therefore, the achievement of Satyapal Singhji and his, so many of his cabinet colleagues, that while it is true that nobody has ever seen apes turn into men, we've seen them make an appreciable, appreciable you know, effort to achieve the reverse process. <laughs> Um, today, uh, I'm, in, I'm in here to introduce um, N. Ram, chairperson of the Hindu group. The person who has done all the work on Rafal and is going to give you a very organized presentation on that. You know Ram as the journalist and the, you know, um, who has done the work on Rafal. Many of you also know of him as the person who spearheaded and anchored the expose on Beaufort's several years ago. And anyway, all the stuff that's happening now, I mean, it's happening in an atmosphere, in a particular atmosphere where a, a large part of the media, with valiant exceptions, genuinely valiant and truly exceptional, with those few exceptions, are making their, you know, are, are making their forebears during the emergency look good. In fact, about the only, about the only fun comment I've seen in this last, uh, only fun opinion I've seen in this last month and a half in the media, came from a stand-up comedian on the internet who the day the release of Abhinandan was announced, he had a flash. Pakistan government announces release of Abhinandan, followed by Indian government agrees to send Arnab Goswami in exchange. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, I thought that said it all in many ways. But uh, that was about the only thing that was fun by way of opinion with the kind of stuff that's been going on. Um, journalism really has morphed into two, two schools. The many diverse schools of journalism have basically boiled down to a couple. There is journalism and there is stenography. <laughs> Increasingly, corporate stenography. Now, you know Ram is the person with, uh, you know, behind the Rafal coverage behind Beaufort's. 
I know him as my former editor-in-chief and I know him for many things, but three I will just mention very briefly. When we are, especially when we are discussing in, in the context of the kind of media we are in, this was the editor who did not hesitate to use the front page. He was an editor, by the way, who was extremely demanding by way of standards of evidence. And when he got those, he did not hesitate to name and shame the biggest media houses and politicians in this country in the paid news scandal, including the then chief minister of this state, Mr. Ashok Chavan. The paid news scandal ran to more than 30 stories in the Hindu and very much on the corporate media. I remember him as the editor who gave some of them were by me. <laughs> some of them were by me, but um, there were others. And it started there in November 2009 with Ashok Chavan. The second is that I also remember that when, when Julian Assange was looking at the, in the first instance for a place to release the Indian tranche of WikiLeaks, the only paper he trusted was the Hindu with Enram. <laughs> Finally, it also went out to others, but it began in the Hindu. And the third, you know, since something has been happening in this country on the agrarian front, since that historic march of 40,000 Adivasi farmers from Nashik to Mumbai, that astonishing march sparked protests by farmers everywhere in the country. It, you saw people from 21 states assembling in Delhi in November, from Chhattisgarh to Andhra Pradesh to Telangana, you saw similar farmers' marches and protests. And the farmers have literally forced themselves on the consciousness of the media and the country. But that crisis, and that's fantastic because they moved from a mindset of passive demoralization to one of active assertion of rights. And you owe it to the Nashik farmers who did that. And so today, you have anchors who never used that word, agrarian rural distress or agrarian crisis, having it in almost every other broadcast. It was very different between 1998 and 2007, when it was very difficult to place the story of agrarian distress, of rural distress, of farmer suicides on uh, the media's on the media's agenda or within its lens, but I, I remember Ram as my editor in chief, who allowed who uh, who not simply allowed us to report that, encouraged us, but also put agrarian and rural distress issues on the op-ed page, on the edit page, and on the front page. As a result of which, I believe you opened up a lot more space in the media for the issues of agrarian distress. Today, though, he's here to talk to us about Rafal, Enra. Almost everyone here, I think, will agree that corruption in India is pervasive, it is omnipresent, and it is diverse or multifarious. Pervasive, you see it everywhere, omnipresent, there are very few exceptions, when you look at sectors and multifarious, that is diverse. And uh, it is to be encountered, especially in the nexus between politics and business. When you talk about business, the defense sector or the military sector is a prime example. And when we are doing the Bofors investigation, and wondering what these so-called commissions were about, whether they were standard, whether they had got normalized, and so on. An unexpected tip came to me from the then President of India, R. Venkataraman. I mentioned this in a book I did on corruption. He had held various ministerial portfolios, including defense, finance, defense. And uh, he was of the old school from the freedom struggle. And he told me 
at that point, of course off the record, but I don't think there's any problem in mentioning it here because it only puts him in a positive light. He said, don't you know that the standard rate of commission in major defense deals is 6%? Now, although it was an informal tip, somebody with that background, I think you had to be taken seriously. And that, indeed, when you looked at the documents, often it was 6% or 3% and, uh, and then 6% and even more. But uh, very often the average would be 6% of the contract value. Corruption has also become normalized. It would be a mistake, I think, to see it as a pathological condition. It is the normal state, and there are exceptions. And of course, I don't want to go too much into the detail, but there is something called grand corruption. It goes back to a famous statement by Hegel, who in describing the state of the church, the Catholic Church of his times, said that, described it as a great and general corruption. That is, these are not uh, exceptions, not aberrations in the system, but the system itself. And in, in, the, in the literature on corruption, which is, uh, which is quite abundant today, as theory as well as empirical studies, you will see the term as a category, grand corruption. Grand corruption is something that affects institutions, that is implicit in policies, that is manifest in policies. And of course you look for exceptions, but unless you look at the defense sector as a sector where grand corruption is the normal condition, because corruption is not just uh, taking bribes. Corruption involves uh, arbitrary decision making. Corruption involves crony capitalism, providing favors. Corruption in, in, covers lobbying in the corridors of the defense ministry or elsewhere to uh, get a deal. Corruption involves using agents, commission agents, who try to fix the deal. This applies to many sectors, but we are here primarily talking about uh, the military, the defense sector in India. As everyone knows, this has become an issue and the Indian opposition, particularly Rahul Gandhi, the Congress president, has been on a vigorous offensive charging the NDA government and particularly the Prime Minister Narendra Modi with bypassing institutions and procedures for defense acquisitions, causing huge losses to public funds, compromising national security, and using the multi-billion dollar Rafale deal. It's actually 7.87 billion euros, the cost of the uh, whole package, that is the aircraft package plus the weapons package, 7.87 billion euros. You could convert it into crores of rupees. And they also accused the government, Mr. Modi, of covering up corruption by refusing to disclose the pricing details. Why pricing? It seems such a technical thing, or a small part of the picture, but I think in the pricing there is a great deal of detail that is hidden. You will remember that uh, in 2014 when uh, the BJP came to power, after pillarizing or pillarying the Congress party, painting it as corrupt and offering themselves. Mr. Modi offered himself and his party as a clean alternative. They, uh, now the compliment is being returned and so on. And un until pull the terrorist attack followed by Pulwama, I think this was gaining a lot of momentum and it remains to be seen how much uh, uh, significance it will have in the election campaign. I think tomorrow they're going to announce uh, the schedule, the election schedule. General elections will be announced. That's the expectation. Now the Rafale deal, it requires, I, I don't want to make it as uh, accessible as possible. 
there's a lot of technical detail involved. We don't have to go into all of that. But the Rafale deal goes back, for those who haven't followed it, till, uh, goes back to 2007. This is called the MMRCA proposal, 2007. MMRCA is, the key is, medium multi-role combat aircraft. Now, medium multi-role combat aircraft, state of the art. So, it was, the background to this is, the Indian Air Force has government approval for 42 squadrons. And the squadron is usually 18 fighter jets. And it is, it is believed that the current squadron strength, strength is in the low 30s compared with the, they actually asked for 45, but 42 have been sanctioned. The cost, huge. The cost is enormous. And from about 1999-2000, a need was felt. It was generally agreed to upgrade aircraft and augment the squadron strength. And this actually goes back to the NDA, the Vajpayee government's period, in principle approval given by the then Defence Minister to buy 126 fighter aircraft for seven new squadrons to bring it up closer to, to narrow the gap. Next slide, please. So th this is the process. I don't want, you don't have to go into all of this, but just to get, give you an idea, user requirements, they're called ser services quality requirements, SQRs, ready in June 2006. June 2007, Defense Acquisition Council. During the Bofors days, were, these procedures were not there. I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. So clears the proposal for 126, 18 fly away to be bought directly from the original manufacturer plus 108 make in India to be manufactured under license and a transfer of technology by HAL, Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, which is in Bangalore, and to be delivered for a period of 11 years from the time of signing the contract. Bids invited in August 2007 for 126. Next, please. After Cargill especially, a new set of defense procurement management stru structures and systems were uh, developed and put in place in the defense ministry. Elaborate defense procurement procedure, and you see the number DPP, defense proce uh, procurement procedure 2002, introduced in December 2002 during the Vajpayee government. And this has been repeatedly revised, the scope has been expanded. 2005, 2006, 2008, 2011, 2013, which is the uh, procedure that applies to the current uh, the Rafale deal, and 2016, to bring in indigenous manufacture, transfer of technology, offsets, etc. And it is re these are mandated, these are legally required. Acquisition process must include the following. Preparation of user requirements, acceptance of necessity by this high-powered body called the Defense Acquisition Council, which is headed by the Defense Minister uh, in major cases, and inviting offers. You must tender and it must be transparent. And then evaluation, by technical, technical evaluation, field, field evaluation, staff evaluations, oversight by technical oversight committee. And then commercial negotiations to be handled by the contract negotiation committee. Approval by competent financial authority. Award of contract, supply order and contract administration and post-contract management. These are details, but you can see the elaborate procedures that have been worked out. And they are, if you go to the Defense Ministry website, you will see these details. The, con the pro forma, the con the, uh, uh, forms are available, what, what, what clauses uh, the contract should uh, have, what are the safeguards and so on. And coming to the present deal, or what was the Rafale deal before Mr. Modi made his surprise announcement on uh, April 10, 2015. Six vendors submit proposals, 2008 April. Technical evaluations approved June 2009, <coughs> a little over a year. Field evaluations, 2009 and 10, and then staff evaluation report of those evaluations accepted 
in April 2011. Yes. The, two, the winner and two were identified, two qualified. They had everything that the Air Force wanted in the field evaluations. Rafale, manufactured by Dassault Aviation, and Eurofighter, manufactured by a consortium of companies uh, in several European countries, the United Kingdom, Germany, Italy, and France. Aeronautics and, and, and aeronautical and other companies. These two qualified Rafale and Eurofighter. It's called the Eurofighter Typhoon. Technical Oversight Committee report approved in June 2011. Commercial bids opened in January 2012. Yes, please. And Dassault, or rather the Rafale fighter jet was determined to be L1 is the lowest bidder. That's the winner. L2 is the runner-up. In January of 2012, it was declared L1. Declared the winner. Here is what uh, has not been much reported in the media, but you will find reference to it if you search. Compl and Mr. A.K. Anthony, the, the, the Defense Minister of the UPA government, has gone, uh, has provided us some information on this. Complaints of irregularities in price determination process began during the rounds at that very time. And guess who? Subramanian Swami and Yashwan Sinha was then in BJP plus three members of the contract negotiating committee alleged irregularities in determining who was the winner, who was L1 and who was L2. Yes, please. Yes. So what happens? Contract negotiations are on. They are authorized. They begin in February 2012. And this is extremely significant. In June 2012, Defense Minister Antony directs the contract negotiating committee to complete negotiations with L1 vendor so that you don't delay that process and submit its report. But after that, finance and uh, others in the Ministry of Defense must re-examine the contract negotiating committee's approach and methodology to see if determination of L1 was caught reasonable, appropriate, and as per laid down procedure. In July 2014, MSEs, as later Airbus, they represent the, uh, Euro, the Eurofighter Consortium. They make, it, they, write, they write to Arun Jaitley, who was then Defense Minister, encouraged by him, and make a new offer. This is in July 2014, after, after the Modi government came to power. So they make a new offer that looks to many mouth-wateringly attractive. Improve, I mean, from an Air Force standpoint. Improved Air for, uh, aircraft capabilities, favorable payment terms, enhanced transfer of technology process by setting up production line and Eurofighter Typhoon Industrial Park in India and accelerated delivery. But more than anything, I've left that out here, a 20% discount. A 20% discount on the old offer. And three domain experts, there are only three domain experts who know finance and procurement on the Indian negotiating team, asked for the Eurofighter quote for 36 Rafale derivative equivalent. You have to align the cost. Assuming that you're buying only 36 Eurofighters, Eurofighter jets, you make a comparison. They wanted this to be considered and also for the price to be uh, compared so that you can bargain with Rafale, with uh, Dassault. They were overruled four to three, and those are documents we have published as not being in line with the defense procurement procedure and also with CDC guidelines. Report of Enquiry Committee. This information has been revealed by Mr. Anthony now. Report of, it's not in the public domain otherwise. Report of Enquiry Committee submitted to Defense Minister Manohar Parikar in March 2015. Report ignored. Apparently it, it, it has some negative findings. Two sticking points in the negotiations which uh, are going on. HAL was estimated to require, need 2.7 times the man hours needed to make one Rafale aircraft in France. 
That's uh, the difference in labor productivity, maybe other, other factors as well. Dassault Aviation required to undertake contractual obligations for all 126, including the 108 to be manufactured in India. They were not willing to do so. They wouldn't, wouldn't underwrite uh, uh, HAL's uh, uh, capability in this respect. And these were the two sticking points in the, in the talks, in the negotiations to acquire the 126 uh, Rafale aircraft, one, uh, 108 to be manufactured in India. Yes. March 25, 2015, two weeks before the Prime Minister's uh, announcement in Paris, Dassault Chairman Eric Trappier assures a press conference in France that the Rafale deal is 95% completed. 95% completed. Yes. And closer, closer to the visit on uh, April 8th, two days before the announcement in Paris, foreign, then Foreign Secretary Jay Shankar says, my understanding is there are discussions underway between French, that is Dassault, Defense Ministry and HAL, and these are ongoing dis discussions. We do not mix up leadership level visits with deep details of ongoing defense contracts. So this, I think, is uh, very significant. Was he in the know? We don't know. Or was he uh, deliberately being diplomatic? We do not know that. New deal announced in Paris, joint through a joint Indo-French agreement statement during Prime Minister, the Prime Minister's visit. Uh, and it says it, there'll be IGA's intergovernmental agreement. We'll have an intergovernmental agreement with France, not a commercial, not directly with uh, Dassault, and uh, MBDA, the company, the French company that manufactures the weapons, for the, the aircraft, we to acquire 36 Rafale jets in flyaway condition as quickly as possible. And this is crucial on terms that would be better than conveyed by Dossor Aviation as part of a separate process underway. And they also promise speedier delivery and longer maintenance, maintenance responsibility by France. Yes. Yeah, this is where our stories come in. I'll just go quickly on them and answer questions if there is time. The, the, Mr. Mr. Modi's decision to go for New Deal shot the price up by 41% over 2007. Why 2007? I was criticized at that time for putting that in the headline because we also said compared with uh, 2011 or 2012, it was 14%. But the point here is there was already a rival offer which had been encouraged by, the, by Ar Arun Jaitley, the then Defence Minister, in July 2014. You could have used that at the very least to bargain, bargain down, to push down the price, something close to the 2007 offer, but they did not do that. And uh, we explain next how, how it went up. The, the basic reason was there were two reasons for this. One was the French demanded 1.4 billion euros as the design and development cost for 13 India-specific enhancements which the Indian Air Force wanted. They wanted it earlier, the old deal, and they wanted it now. This was a fixed, non-recurring cost. Earlier it was going to be spread over 126. Now it's spread over 36. And therefore, the price per fully fitted, combat-ready Rafale jet, fighter jet, goes up by 41%. That, that is the price. And they just would not budge. And there's a, another story behind it. The second, the second, reason, was the, uh, second reason for that was, the, uh, yeah, the, the first reason was the very high exorbitant cost. The, Three domain experts on the, uh, among the negotiating team objected to this as too high, but they were overruled again 4-3. Protest. Now this is where the whole effort was undercut or undermined. This is our uh, second story. Protest against parallel negotiations. Protest against parallel negotiations. The, behind the back of the Indian negotiating team, the officials from the Prime Minister's office and the National Security Advisor conduct parallel talks and 
the, the, the team, uh, the negotiators come to uh, learn about it only when the head of the French negotiating team tells them, your officials have already agreed on this. When they put forward a demand, now this is corruption. When uh, this is clearly a facet of corruption because when you negotiate in all good faith and somebody else who is over you or behind you uh, tries to undercut what happens, uh, your negotiating position, I think there's something seriously wrong. There's a stench of corruption there. And they protest. Yes, next. I, I'll, there's no time to go into this, we, the documents that show this. The then defense minister, uh, defense secretary strongly endorses this uh, protest. The later on, ANI, uh, another document was leaked which shows that uh, the de defense minister was non-committal and pushed it up to the prime minister's office. Next. Our third story, very, very serious. The Modi government waives the anti-corruption clauses in the supply protocols. The French say no. Anti-corruption clause, yes, next. Non-inclusion of the standard clauses related to penalty for undue influence. Agent stroke agency commission and access to accounts of the book of accounts of the companies, the commercial suppliers. And these are in the supply protocols. The French absolutely refuse to accept it. And uh, because of the parallel negotiations, although the nego Indian negotiators demand this, and the law ministry has advised this, Ministry of Law and Justice, they have uh, refused and it's not part of the deal. Yes. Dissent note by the three domain experts. This is a an explosive document. Uh, we have published the whole thing, eight pages, where they, on virtually every issue uh, relating to the new Rafale deal, they, they, they take a bold and courageous stand and uh, they give the reasons for why uh, it sh they, they should not go through. Again, they were overruled four to three. Uh, and this, I think, is uh, serious. Next. And the final story we published, the fifth R5, Damaging revelations and final report of Indian negotiating teams. Yes, next. And the conclusion is, you are comparing non-comparables. In the old deal, bank guarantees have been loaded in, in the price, in the cost, the costing. And the Indian negotiating team estimate, computes this at 574 million euros. So 574 million euros are the estimated bank, lo bank guarantee loading charges in the original deal for, and uh, here they refuse to give bank guarantees. They refuse to give sovereign guarantees or government guarantees and they refuse to give bank guarantees. But because of the intervention by the Prime Minister's office and the National Security Advisor, they, the, the deal goes through without bank guarantees being loaded if in the final report of the Indian negotiating team, which we have, and also in the CAG's report, they, in, in, they deliberately leave this 574 million euros out of the, out, or out of the picture uh, while saying that the new deal is slightly better than the old one in terms of price, on better terms and so on. But the dissenters, the three domain experts, this is the table they have put out in their dissent note and actually, the old deal was better. And apart from that, uh, as the Congress has charged, the Air Force has been shortchanged. 36, two squadrons now instead of seven, the seven squadrons that were uh, asked for, and so on. There are uh, other aspects on an ongoing negotiation, offset issues, and so on. Crony capitalism has been alleged, and uh, this deal has uh, tried to benefit. Uh, a bit, uh, what con con Congress, the Congress president has made the charge openly, 30,000 crores and so on. Uh, but this remains to be investigated, the offset arrangement. This will be over a period of seven years and uh, what, what benefits or favors come to the various offset partners in India, I think remains to be investigated. That's where the story is at this point of time. Uh, and. Uh, this is uh, what we have been able to do. I hope I made things reasonably accessible and clear. Uh, but for those who are interested, you can go back to the 
uh, texts and, and, and read them. They're all uh, available. The question is that why you have dealt with this Carl Dagari, which has been indulged in post 10th April 2015. Prior to that, how the figure of 126 came down to 36 on 10th April, while on 8th April, the Foreign Secretary had no idea. Even on 14th April, the Defense Secretary had no idea. He said, probably it is because of this and that. Uh, my specific question is about the offset partners as uh, there is nothing categorical I understand has come how the Ambani is being directly benefited and how other things, uh, companies which will be a part of this offset, how will they be benefited? That is number one. Number two, how does a common man, see we are all comparatively in a better position to understand corruption as it is in this, but how does a common man on the street gets to know about what actually is happening in Rafael and how is it corruption for them? Because jingoism is being okay. Okay. Mr. Mr. Modi has accused the UPA of delaying the entire negotiation and uh, that seems to raise certain questions. That's one. So what, what's your uh, take on that? And uh, an another question I want to ask you is, uh, have we heard the last word on this or there is more to come? <laughs> okay, uh, Ram, will you reply? Uh, and one question, obviously the offsets have to be looked into, there is material on that. Offsets, just let me explain very briefly that in this, usually it's uh, a supplier on the scale agrees to, uh, to invest about at least 30% of the contract value in the country, in the home country, say in India. But in this case, Dawson has agreed to invest 50%, uh, which is a bit surprising. But most of it is loaded at the back end. It's over a seven-year period. And I think uh, the, 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 these, the, the three domain experts have criticized the offset arrangements, the way the government has uh, gone about it. Uh, and this, this is an area that uh, is being investigated. The, uh, and especially the role of Mr. Anil Ambani's uh, joint venture with Gasol what they are actually going to produce as well as others, what, what is the role for HAL, uh, for DRDO and so on, these are there. On the question of delay, it is true that there was a delay but that is not surprising because to uh, do a transfer of technology uh, agreement and actually to, to realize it is not so easy. HAL has considerable capabilities and the BJP manifesto, if you look at the last 2014 election manifesto, made a special point of saying we must enhance and raise to a new level our uh, indigenous uh, defense manufacturing capability, Make in India, the Make in India slogan, particularly in the defense sector. It made that promise and uh, that has been completely abandoned. That is one of the criticisms. The, the, one of the reasons for the delay is what uh, I, I mentioned there, the irregularities that were alleged. The moment the uh, L1 the, the winner was uh, uh, announced or determined and announced uh, irregularities in price determination. How, how are they L1 and how is uh, Eurofighter L2? That was, I think, the allegation made by Subramanian Swami, Yashwan Sinha, and, and even more important, three members of the contract negotiating committee who should know, should have known. And to the credit of Mr. Anthony, I would say, he, uh, he, he did not complete the deal. He ordered an inquiry, and, but did not allow, but did not want the contract negotiations to be delayed. So it's a simultaneous process. You do the negotiations, but after that, you look into this. Inquiry committee goes into it, finds fault with the methodology of determining L1, gives it to, then the government has changed in 2015. Manohar Parikar, of course, he had no say in the matter. I sympathize with him. He's not well. So, <laughs> uh, but he had no role in this, but it was just ignored uh, in, in 2015. Uh, what, the other, how does one make it? Uh, that's, that's a huge task. You know, these are complex issues. I don't think you can talk down to people by just uh, oversimplifying the issue and doing it. Uh, we, if you have to, journalists, have, Sainath is a master of that, making 
complex things accessible uh, in, a, in a, an interesting and attractive way in his journalism. All along he has been practicing that. That is a special gift in journalism. Of course, you can always talk down to people, which we, I don't think uh, any of us wants to do. But how do you make ordinary people uh, realize corruption? They, they, the Congress is doing it and others. They're alleging corruption, 30,000 crores. The Prime Minister is a thief and so on, they say. And that's not, but that's not our journalism. We have to look at, uh, look at the specifics. And it is a fact that the money trail hasn't yet been discovered. The money trail in the sense of commission payments. But why would you remove the anti-corruption clauses? What on earth can be the justification for removing the anti-corruption clauses? The French side said this is an intergovernmental agreement, therefore there's no place for it. You don't have it with Russia, you don't have it with the US. But in the case of Russia, there's a everything is channeled through a state organization. They completely control it. The commercial players are not directly involved in any deal with India. In the case of the United States, there is the Foreign Military Sales Program, FMS, which is underwritten by law. And the U.S. government takes responsibility for all transfers. And in the note that uh, we have, the last thing we published, you know, the final report of the Indian negotiating team, they say the French site is reported to have said, uh, is reported there to have said, we don't have the arrangements the U.S. has. We, we don't have all those arrangements to oversee uh, all the commercial details and so on. So in this case, and these clauses, it's known as the integrity pact. No commission agents, no undue influence, and the buyer has to have access to the book of accounts of those companies to see if there's any hanky-panky there. And uh, all this was denied. This is not in the intergovernmental agreement itself. It's in the supply protocols that are uh, annexures to the IGA or the intergovernmental agreement. And then so far, which is why all this was concealed. Why did they conceal the pricing? Because they had paid too much for design and development. And considering the fact that now you're buying 36 rather than 126, the price per aircraft goes up. What happens if a Rafale jet is shot down anywhere? So much money is blown away, which would go into uh, assuring a, li a living uh, uh, minimum wage, schools, hospitals, and so on. You're talking about hundreds of crores of rupees, billions of dollars, or millions of do dollars or euros. And uh, so these, if, if, you are care if you are negligent about these things, wantonly negligent, don't care about it in the name of national security and so on, is that not corruption? Is that not criminal misconduct? These are the issues, I think, that have to be debated. And uh, we have to be, journalists have to be careful, whether it's Sainath or me or anyone else here. I think journalism is essentially a discipline of verification. But we also have to interpret, provide background and analysis. It's for others to take this. The way that uh, VP Singh uh, took uh, to the Hindi-speaking areas, in particular, what we published on Bofors in, in the 19, late 1980s. Uh, they oversimplified it, sometimes they overstated it, but that's the name of the game. So that has to be done by others, in particular people who, who are uh, activists and so on in this collective. I think that was terrific and you've got an absolutely full house upstairs and downstairs on a Sunday morning. That's amazing too. Uh, the reflection that I take away in, in terms of media and the question of crony capitalism that keeps coming up, there was an economist one time who went on to occupy a very high office in this country, who in another avatar asked about crony capitalism. He said, is there any other kind? <laughs> no. My own, my own question is, if there is such a thing as crony capitalism, who's the crony? We know capitalism. <laughs> Maybe you want to think about the media in that light. Thank you. Thank you, Ram. Thank you.